The objective of this video is to review the operation of the single pole double throw converter and introduce stiffness interfaces at the converter terminals. So I've started by sketching the single pole double throw converter that we introduced in the previous video. And as you recall, the principal operation of this is to assume that we have a DC voltage attached across the throws and that we have a constant pole current. The pole is then connected between the two throws in a way to create an average output voltage and an average throw current for each of the throws. So again, this operates as a voltage divider or a current divider in an average sense. We're reducing the voltage, we're reducing the throw voltage as observed on the pole by modulating our pole between the two throws. The way this converter works is that you get to specify either how the voltage is divided or the current is divided. So that's to say that we can specify what our pull voltage is as a fraction of our throw voltage, or we can specify what each of the individual throw currents is in an average sense. But we don't get to specify both. Once you've specified what your pull voltage is, your throw currents are determined. This principle of operation as being a voltage divider and a current divider only works if stiffness constraints are met. What do I mean by this? I mean that we've, again, assumed that our throw voltage is constant and our pole current is constant. We can only divide our throw voltage to an average pole voltage if that throw voltage is indeed constant. So to obtain this constant throw voltage and constant pole current, we add voltage and current stiffeners or also referred to as capacitors and inductors. So we can view this inductor right here as a current stiffness source. And in fact, you can recall from when we originally sketched this converter, we drew this as being a current source. We can view our capacitor right here as being a source of voltage stiffness, which Again, you'll recall when we originally sketched this converter, we sketched it as a voltage source. Let's now consider what it means to mix switches with current stiffness sources or inductors. And we're going to do this by considering three cases or three example circuits. In the first case, we have a switch that's closed connecting a voltage source across an inductor. And let's assume our inductor is one millihenry and that we have two amps of current flowing through it. And what I want you to consider is what is the voltage across our switch? What is the value of Vx? So think about this for a second. It's in steady state conditions. We have two amps of current flowing. We have a 30 volt external circuit somehow attached here. Uh, what is the voltage across our switch? Think about this for a second. Hit the pause button and when you're ready, hit play to resume. Okay, the voltage across our switch is an ideal switch. It's exactly zero volts. The switch is closed, which means that we have short-circuited our circuit to our one millihenry inductor. Now, consider case two. In this case, we've opened our switch. And we again have our one millihenry inductor and two amps of current. So in case two, what is the voltage across our switch the instant that we open it? Hit the pause button and hit play when you're ready to hear the answer. Okay, so clearly we have an inductor in the circuit. Um, an inductor is governed by this differential equation. And if we open our switch, we're forcing the current to be zero. However, we see that the voltage across our inductor our inductor depends on the derivative of our current. So that means that at, at, at this instant of time, we have some negative infinity voltage, which is another way of saying that it's indeterminate. We don't know what the voltage is, but it, this is an unviable situation. You can't instantaneously interrupt two amps of current flowing through an inductor because an inductor, again, is a current stiffness source or a current source. Okay, now consider case three. 
which is the same as case two, but we're going to assume that the switch opens over 100 nanoseconds. And what is VL during this transition? So hit the pause button and hit play when you're ready to discuss. Okay, so we can calculate VL from our differential equation and assume that our current ramps at a rate of negative two amps per 100 nanoseconds, so the current is shutting off over a 100 nanosecond period. This results in negative 20 kilovolts. So here we can clearly interrupt that current. However, we had to create negative, we had to withstand negative 20 kilovolts across our switch in order to do it. And good luck finding a switch that can withstand negative, two, negative 20 kilovolts and open in such a short interval of time. This falls into the category of a fault interrupter or a circuit breaker. So we can see from this example, from this progressively developed example, that placing a switch in series with a current stiffness source or an inductor is a bad idea. It requires a huge voltage to interrupt the current. So in the switch mode power converters, what we do instead is we ensure that our switches are never in series with our inductors. If you look at, if you go back to our topology above for the single pole double throw converter, <clears throat> you can see that our pole is instantaneously commutated between each of the throws. So the current to that inductor, the pole current, is never interrupted. The pole current is always either equal to the first throw's current or the second throw's current. The reason that we've placed a capacitor across our throw is to function as a decoupling capacitor. You've probably heard about this in a previous course or in an engineering project that you, you always must place decoupling capacitors close to sensitive electronic parts. The purpose of the decoupling capacitor is to mitigate any parasitic inductance that might be in series with your power source. So if we're operating the single pole double throw converter, presumably we have some fundamental power source. Maybe out here we've got a battery, or maybe it's our DC rectifier that we've talked about previously. So this might be a long ways away, and it might have, if it's a long ways away, it certainly has some inductance in series with the cable. And that inductance would, ap would appear in series with our throws if we didn't have this decoupling capacitor. So the job of the decoupling capacitor, or the bus capacitor as we typically refer to it in power electronics, is to decouple that inductor from our single pole double throw switch so we don't have the situation where we're trying to interrupt a current source. So in conclusion from this discussion, we can say that that inductors and capacitors are critical to single pole double throw switches to ensure that KVL and KCL is met. That Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law can be met during transitions without resulting in infinite voltage or infinite current. The single pole double throw converter is the building block for nearly all power electronic converters. I want you to memorize this. You should sketch this in your notebook repeatedly with the inductor and capacitor, or the voltage and current stiffness sources included. This is something that's going to come up time and time again in our class, and is a very important concept to understand the more advanced topics that we will be discussing later. Next, we're going to consider one final example. I want you to draw a converter that steps a 9 volt battery up to a 12 volt load. Your converter should utilize one single pole double throw switch, one inductor, and one capacitor. So I want you to pause the video now and sketch this. Hit play when you're ready to resume. So if you should have sketched in your notebook the single pole double throw switch, and across it, you should have labeled your throw voltage. On the high voltage side, you should have connected your load.
and your capacitor, your decoupling or your bus capacitor. On the low voltage side is the inductor and your battery. Now I want to point out that you could have connected your battery in one of two locations. I've drawn it in a bottom location, but you also could have connected it to the top of your pole. But the point is, is that your single pole double throw converter is able to reduce a voltage. It's able to reduce the high side voltage to the low side voltage, but allow bi-directional power flow. So if we label the direction of our pole current as such, and we've got our throw voltage labeled, I want you to tell me what is the polarity of our throw voltage and our, th and our pole current. So think about this for a sen second. Indicate the polarity of the throw voltage and the pole current for either battery location. Hit the pause button and plus Press play when you are ready to resume. So the throw voltage always has a positive polarity. We can see that regardless of where the battery is connected, the throw voltage is actually determined by our load voltage and it's always 12 volts. The pole current, however, has a polarity that's determined by the direction of the power flow. So for the bottom location, you can see that our, our pole current has to have a negative direction power is flowing from the battery into the pole and up to the load. If the, if the battery is in the top position, however, <clears throat> pole current again has to flow from the battery and to the load, but this requires a current to take the path like this, which will have an opposite direction pole current. So if the battery is in the top position, our pole current is actually positive. And this definition of, and this distinction of polarity in the throw voltage and polarity in the pole current determines how semiconductors can be used to implement this single pole double throw switch. That will be the topic of our next video.